Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you. I'd like to welcome everyone, but especially I would like to welcome Dr. Margaret Caudill to, to our, our building this evening, um, to the presentation that we're going to be listening to, of her presenting the evidence that we're all very eager to hear. As we begin this evening, I just want to pass on a little bit of information regarding tonight's format. Dr. Caudill will present to us in a lecture style and she will send a copy of her PowerPoint presentation to anyone who requests it. So I just say that, don't feel that you have to take heavy notes, you're welcome to take notes, but I just want to relieve you of that responsibility that she is willing just to send you her notes and, or her PowerPoint presentation if you just let her know that you're interested. She's also willing to answer all questions that may arise as she is speaking to us. On your way in, you were given a piece of paper, and if a question comes to your mind, we just ask that you would write that down, and then if you would pass it to the pew, somebody will pick it up, and we're going to take the questions, and we're going to have this team of uh, people. Reverend Lindsay McGregor is the day chaplain at the Hanover District Hospital, and she's also on staff here at Hanover Missionary. Major Sterling Snow Grove is at the um, Salvation Army Church, and Major, just raise your hand. And Dr. Pamela Gold, from the uh, doctor here in Hanover, is going. Uh, they're going to take your questions, and then instead of asking the same question several times throughout the evening, we're going to have a time at the at the end of um, the doctor's presentation to to us, and um, that's when the questions will be answered. If you have any personal questions that arise, Dr. Caller also has informed me that she'd be willing to stay around after the presentation and just to assure you that nobody has to leave here this, this evening with any questions in regards to what she's going to be speaking to us about. Well, let me share a little bit that I've learned about Dr. Caller. She is indeed a noted expert who shares of her experience. She's an author, she's a speaker, and a, a, a palliative care physician in Vancouver, BC, where she's been caring for the terminally ill patients for the past 20 years. She's also a clinical instructor at her alma mater, UBC Medical School. And she is the Vice President of the Board of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition of Canada and serves on the Christian um, Advocacy Society of Greater Vancouver. She and her husband, Robin, have two children that they enjoy sharing their life with adult children. So we're going to learn some things. I've come prepared in a stance to be learning this evening from, from the doctor. So I don't want to take too much time away from her, so let's welcome her tonight as she equips us to seek the welfare of our country and our communities. Dr. Margaret Calter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me now? Just make sure we've got that, get that done well. So thank you so much for coming out tonight and listening to this. Uh, because this is a medical presentation, doctors always have to do a disclosure slide. So sadly, I have no personal relationship with any commercial interest <laughs> to make money out of any of this. So there's my first disclosure. And my second disclosure slide is my Anne of Green Gables disclosure. Now Anne once said to Marilla, although I say far too much, if yet if you only knew how many things I want to say and don't, you'd give me some credit for it. So I'm telling you that up front tonight that there is going to be a lot of information. And I apologize in advance. I know it's bad pedagogically to throw a lot of stuff at you, but I'm in a bit of a, between a rock and a hard place because much of the information that I have to share with you tonight is not being uh, available to you in any other way. So I've brought things from lots of different sources and I just want to be able to present all of it there. Uh, the other thing is that <clears throat> 
I want you to know that this is kind of a smorgasbord. You don't, when you go to the smorgasbord, you don't have to have a full helping of everything. So just taste and see and just take what is, what's there for you tonight. Don't feel as though you have to eat everything and digest it all. You're not going to be able to do that. I, I rec recognize that. I will, uh, the slides themselves as well, they always say, oh, just put a couple words on a slide, don't fill it up. You're going to just choke when you see some of them because they're just full of text. But I do that on purpose because then when I send you the slides, I'll give you my email address at the end, when I send you the slides, you'll have all of that information. It won't be, oh, it just says doctor in Belgium. Well, that doesn't help you very much two weeks from now if that's when you get around. But if it's the story of what's going on, then you'll, you'll know. So that's why I know it's, it goes against all educational principles, but I think I just wanted to let you know that's why I do that. Uh, there's also a resource at the resource list at the end, quite a few slides that have different resources that if you're interested in doing more research about this, that you can look into those things. And then I, I guess I would ask you to think about what is most compelling for you. Even if you go away with a few nuggets tonight, that's great. And just think about the things that mean the most and make the most sense to you. You don't have to digest all of it. And think about your own stories and your own experiences and how, how they fit in. I do want to uh, say thank you for inviting me here. I'm grateful to be able to talk about this. It's really important to me. And I have, my views are based on more than 25 years, more than 26 years now, of caring for people at the end of life and caring for their families. And so it's not just about what I've read. It's personal experience as well. And one of the things that I understand and that most of us who care for people at the end of life understand is that when when people are in desperate situations, they're quite vulnerable. And so this idea that somehow every decision we make can be completely autonomous, it's completely independent, is really just a myth. Because I think if you think of your own lives and you think of the decisions that you're making, you're always taking into consideration the people around you and how it's going to affect them. So we're all connected. And to me, that's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. And the other thing I want to acknowledge right up front is that I know there are many diverse opinions and backgrounds. And you may come here tonight and be thinking, I think euthanasia and assisted suicide are the best things that have happened to Canada in 2,000 years, you know, whatever. I think it's just a wonderful thing. And I'm, I welcome you here. And if you've got questions, if you think that I'm, I'm really happy to talk to you afterward as well, it's not something that, uh, that I think people are evil if they believe differently than I do. In fact, I completely understand that the vast majority of people who uh, favor these practices do so on grounds of compassion. So please don't feel that you're being judged. I think we need to look at the evidence. What does the evidence show about the safety of these things, about what it says about us as individuals and as a community. But everybody's welcome here, and everybody's opinions uh, are welcome too. I do think there are <clears throat> many good reasons to oppose these practices, and I'm going to give you some evidence from scientific and medical studies, experience in other jurisdictions, and even some faith-based uh, considerations. Now, I can argue with this. Uh, I've done it. In fact, I had 14 media interviews in 24 hours on around the 6th of February and was pretty burned out at the end of that, I have to say. So I can talk about this in a completely secular setting, but since the, the good people of Hanover have invited me to speak in a church, I also feel that it's kind of foolish not to bring in some of the faith-based things. But we also have to be careful about where we use which arguments. And we, we need to uh, speak into the, into the situation where we find ourselves. So I'm, that's one of the things. Uh, the other thing is that everyone says, oh, every, the, we need to keep religion out, out of this. But religious and philosophical 
ideas should be perfectly acceptable as part of the discussions in a democracy, but at the moment that's seldom the case. So we have to figure out ways to talk about things where we have things in common. And one of those things is that everyone makes decisions based upon some sort of a set of philosophical principles. Whether or not that person realizes it or not, they believe something to cause them to act in a certain way. And sometimes they don't understand what that is, but uh, they, they do believe something. And to be honest, respectful civil discourse is really hard to find. Uh, and I have been out in the media and I can tell you I've had some pretty horrible things said about me uh, in person and uh, especially in the internet kind of comments. I stopped reading those after about one time through that because it was just, it, it was kind of mind-boggling how, how bad it was and how nasty it was. Uh, and uh, I, I really, uh, I couldn't believe that we couldn't talk about something that's this important without degenerating into that type of discussion. So that's not what you're going to find here tonight. I'm going to try to be as respectful as I can, and uh, I've already told you I, I completely respect uh, everybody's opinion. I ju I'm currently serving on a national group called the, with the Canadian Society for Palliative Care Physicians. Uh, there's nine of us that are form, have formed a working group on how we as palliative care physicians will respond to the Supreme Court decision. It's, uh, so our working group is about physician hasten death, as we call it, and there is a wide range of people that are serving on that. Most of us are opposed. There's one person who's been quite a spokesperson and a medical advisor for dying with dignity, and I was able, been able able to work with him and we've come up with guidelines together so that's really what I'm looking for here tonight is what can we agree on what can we uh, I just just to help you start to think about these things and <clears throat> I also want us to speak the language of our fellow citizens and colleagues so figure out what it is that they're really worried about and if we can speak into that most of you probably, I know I kind of feel this way, a little bit like Woody Allen who said, I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. And <laughs> I think that, I think all of us sort of feel that way that, you know, if you could, that's, that's part of what is behind this, is that fear of what's going to happen in that dying process. That if I could, if I could go, everything's wonderful, wonderful, and then skip that step <laughs> and be dead, then maybe it would be okay. Uh, and, and that somehow, if we have euthanasia or if we have assisted suicide, that those things are going to allow us to skip that step. And I, I'm here to talk about some of that tonight. Uh, one of the, uh, another person who I think is very interesting is a man named Parker Palmer. And I think he's actually a Quaker. And he's most known for what he, his work in education. And he has this interesting quotation. He said, violence is what happens when we don't know what else to do with our suffering. And I think this is a really interesting quotation. And he says, I think that axiom applies on every level of life. When individuals don't know what to do with their suffering, they do violence to others, to themselves or to others. So think about that in terms of, of these things tonight. That is part of this uh, because no one can, uh, no one can dispute the fact that that uh, that causing someone's death is a violent act, <laughs> or taking your own life is a violent act. So it doesn't get much more violent than that, actually. So is this how we're dealing with our suffering, and is this the best way to deal with suffering? Uh, another interesting question was posed by one of my colleagues from uh, Montreal um, named Serge Dano. And he was asking us at this palliative care conference, is do we think that we're having the push for euthanasia and assisted suicide now? This was a couple of years ago. Because we have difficulty accompanying our patients who are, and our families who are suffering. And it's, it's quite an interesting word in French. Accompagner actually means to be radically present. It doesn't mean just to kind of come along for the ride. It means to really be there. And so his question is, 
are we asking for this now? Because we haven't really learned how to be radically present with one another in ways that are safe for us and in ways that we know how to do this. And I think that's one of the things that, for example, a hospital chaplain needs to learn is how to be radically present with someone who's suffering uh, and not uh, not come unglued yourself in the midst of that. <clears throat> it's certainly something for doctors that, that we need to do. So are we really learning how to suffer with people? Now, within the Christian context, I'm going to bring in a little bit of the, the Christian things now, that we have a lot as, as a Christian community to offer that people are looking for. And I think there's two things that I see in the world today, especially in the world of people who are dying and people who are, are in desperate situations. They're looking for a sense of home. They're looking for a community where they can belong. And they're also looking for that radical presence. And I think when we think about Jesus being God with us, Emmanuel, that is a, the best example in the whole world that we have of that radical presence, of that, that accompagné. So those are, people are hungry for those things. And if we find ways within our communities to welcome people into our communities and to come alongside them when they're suffering, then maybe there wouldn't be such a, a great desire for some of these things. We certainly find that with our patients, that when they, they see their lives as being important to other people, and when they have family members come around them and care for them, often they're, if they have had an interest in having their deaths hastened, it often disappears. So just think about that. If you're from a faith community, think about how that could be put into, uh, put into practice uh, and, you know, even if you're not part of a faith community, there's all sorts of community things that can happen. There are other, uh, other communities where people can be welcomed. We can support one another. Uh, and I think Canada actually is founded on caring for one another and providing for one another, being willing to stand in line a little while so we can all have health care, having a good education system, all of those things. That's part of being part of the community. And so you don't have to be religious at all to believe in community. But let's, let's put the emphasis where it belongs because that's what people are looking for. Another thing I'd like us to do is to really think about the language that we use. Now, I will use the word burden a couple times tonight because it's in the literature. People have a fear of being a burden. But I'm trying very hard to eliminate the word burden from my vocabulary. So even something like when a person has to take a lot of pills, calling it a pill burden, I'm trying to just eliminate that because patients who are vulnerable already feel that they're a burden. So if we can talk about caregiver stress instead of caregiver burden, and some of those things that we, it, it doesn't reinforce what vulnerable people are thinking. So that would be my first thing. Uh, the other thing is, I refuse to call myself a health care provider. And anyone here who is a health care professional should also do that. Because I'm not a vending machine. <clears throat> I am not someone who the patient comes to me and says, I want this, and I you know, automatically write the prescription or order the procedure. I'm a professional. I'm trained in a certain way, and we, if you come to me as my patient, I care about you. I use my training to suggest a course of treatment, and we work on it together. But I'm not a vending machine, and I'm not a provider. And I think that it's, it's very interesting that some of the language that's coming out of this where people are saying, well, doctors should just have to provide this service because it's legal. It, it's actually that, that idea of consumer provider rather than doctor patient where I have a relationship with you and actually a covenantal relationship with you. What's been in the past been called a fiduciary relationship with you, a relationship based on trust, not a relationship based on what I'm going to give you or what you expect when you come to me from that. And I would posit to you that actually a fiduciary relationship is much more in your best interest than just a, a, pro, a provider-consumer relationship. Because people talked about 
in the past about paternalism in medicine and how the patient shouldn't come to the doctor and the doctor just tells you what to do and you go home and you don't have any say about it. I certainly agree with that. But I kind of feel like we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater if we go from paternalism where a trained professional tells an untrained patient what to do to this provider mentality where an untrained patient tells the, the trained professional what to do. That seems not in the patient's best interest to me or in anybody's best interest to me. So I don't see care as a commodity to be purchased. So the other thing I want you to wrap your head around in this is as we're talking about these things, what are the implications for people living with disabilities? If the society's goals change from mutual support and caring for one another and compassion to this solution of death and on top of that, who decides what suffering qualifies for euthanasia? And the big question I want you to ask yourself over and over again is, if you're going to say yes to people on the basis of their own ideas, who do you say no to and on what basis? On what grounds are you going to say no? And that's going to come up a little bit more. So just to start with a couple definitions because people get confused. What's the difference between euthanasia and assisted suicide? So in layman's terms, assisted suicide is prescribing the pills where the person will go to the doctor and it, there's different formats that are used. Usually there's, you need more than one doctor, usually you need a, a waiting period of a couple weeks, that sort of thing. But the doctor writes the prescription, the patient takes it to the pharmacy when he or she is ready, the pharmacist uh, dispenses the pills, and then the patient takes them home and takes them supposedly whenever he or she chooses. Uh, in most of the jurisdictions there's not any oversight of this, so there's no, no uh, no way to be sure that there wasn't coercion, but I'll come to that a bit later. But that's assisted suicide. And there is some evidence that not everybody who gets the pills takes the pills. Some people get them and they feel that it's a little bit of a security blanket, that if I had ever got too bad, then I could, I could take these pills. Euthanasia, on the other hand, is what people would call pushing the syringe. So that's when the doctor actually injects medication into the patient while the person is there, obviously, and causes the death of the patient. So that's what's coming in Quebec next month, well, December. And because there's a possibility for failure. Each of the doctors is being given two of the kits, so if the first kit doesn't work, then they can make sure that the person is dead at the end of it. And it's a three-part series. They're giving uh, uh, set a, uh, um, they're giving a medication to calm the person's nerves first, then they're giving a medication to put the person to sleep, and then they're giving another medication to stop the heart. And so if there's any problems with that, then they've got a second kit. So that's what's coming in Quebec. That's euthanasia. And it's interesting that actually more people tend to go for euthanasia than go for assisted suicide. Because if all you have to do is sort of lie there in the bed and say, I think I'd rather be dead now, then, and the doctor does it all, you don't have to go, you don't have to pick up the pills, you don't have to swallow the pills, you don't have to do all these things, then fewer people avail themselves of that than if all you have to do is just lie there and somebody else does you in. So that's the, the idea behind that. So those of us at the, uh, the, the palliative care physicians group, we have, st we have changed the name that we've called it. We're calling it physician hastened death. And even the person who's in favor of it says that that's okay. So that's a fairly neutral term. It's really hard to find a neutral term that actually, <laughs> that actually describes it. So there are two types of physician hastened death. There's patient administered physician hastened death, which is physician assisted suicide. And there's physician administered physician hastened death. So the re we, part of the reason that we, we went away from uh, calling things aid in dying or uh, medical aid in dying or physician assisted death or any of those things is that people do not understand what those terms mean. All, many people think that those things mean just stopping treatment and other people think that it means palliative care and that's not the case as we will see as we go along. <clears throat> The other thing that I think is really important to bring to this is that intent is a really important concept in our legal system. So what your motivation is, 
doesn't really matter to the legal system. If you, if you are merciful and that's your motivation, it doesn't matter. So when Robert Latimer was convicted of killing his daughter Tracy, even though he said his motivation was merciful, uh, debatable, but even if that you take it at face value, he did intend to kill her. He put her in his truck and he hooked up the, uh, the, the vacuum hose from the tailpipe and she was dead. So he was convicted because he did intend to kill her. And that's what our law, up until this point, has been based on, has been based upon intent. And if I tell you that I ran over a child on the street in front of my house this morning, can you tell me my punishment? Well, no, you can't because if the child was chasing a ball and I slammed on the brakes and I wasn't on my phone and I wasn't speeding and I wasn't drunk and all those things and somebody could say she really tried to avoid him, uh, <clears throat> then... I wouldn't even be charged. But if I were doing any of those other things, any kind of distracted driving or whatever, I could be charged at a certain level. And if I hated the little brat and was waiting around the corner to run him over when he was on his way to school, then that's murder. You know? So my intent makes all the difference as to what was, whether he, I, I intended him to be dead. Now people on the other side of this debate for me will say, well it doesn't really matter, the person's just as dead. But that's not how we think about it. <laughs> you know, in that scenario, the little boy is just as dead. But it makes a huge difference what our intent was. And that has always been the case in our legal system. But that has changed with the Carter decision. Okay, so the Carter decision, which came out on the 6th of, of, um, of uh, February of this year, uh, was a little bit scary because in every, even Peter Mansbridge was talking about, oh, this is now terminally ill patients have the right to have help dying. Well, that's not actually what the decision says. The decision says that the person has to have a grievous, irremediable condition that specifically includes disability. So if you are 18 years old and you've just had a diving accident and you're now paraplegic or quadriplegic, you would qualify under grievous and irremediable. Uh, and who is, and the, the second piece to this is that you have to have intolerable suffering as defined by you. And it specifically includes psychological suffering. So if you uh, have diabetes and, and also the last thing is it, the, the condition is not amenable to a treatment that is acceptable to you. So if you have diabetes that needs insulin and you don't want to give yourself needles, that would qualify technically. If you have a long-term psychiatric illness, that could qualify. Any sort of a disability would qualify. I have a friend who rather tongue-in-cheek says that he's going bald. And if he wants to die while he still has a full head of hair, then who's to say that, he, that his suffering and the indignity that he feels he's going to suffer if he, if, when he goes bald is, is too much? It, it, he gets to choose what's intolerable to him. And we, we laugh a little bit about that, but if we say that's frivolous, on what basis are we doing that? How are we going to say that that's frivolous? And at the moment, the person has to be competent. And that means we have different ways of judging competency. But, and you have to be competent not at the time you request it, but at the time when it's actually done. But I wonder how long that will hold up in the courts when someone is, uh, when there's was a suit that goes to the Supreme Court to say that my mother said she wanted this and now she has a cognitive disability and she's being discriminated against on the basis of a cognitive disability to not get what she said she definitely wanted. I would also say to you, when you're speaking to people, that that question, who do you say no to, is a really good, if really good question to ask other people who seem to be in favor of it. Because if you say something like, well, I think it would be hard to draw the line, then they don't, all they have to say to you is, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> but if you say, okay, give me an instance of someone that you would say no to. Tell me who you would say no to. 
And then if they give you an instance, you say, how are you going to make that determination? How are you going to decide that that's grievous and irremediable? How are you going to decide that they have intolerable suffering, that they don't have intolerable suffering, that, that the treatment, they should be following a treatment? So that's a good, get, make, put them on the spot. Uh, now this, you have to follow me a little bit. It's, they actually used mostly the right to life, life, liberty, and security of the person, but mostly the right to life as the rationale for giving people, for decriminalizing uh, someone, a doctor helping someone to die. And this is how this works. So uh, Gloria Taylor, who was the woman who had ALS, she said that if she gets to a certain point in her disease, she would want to be able to take her own life. Okay, so maybe that's over here at, at point C. But in order to take her own life, she would have to do it at point A because that's when she still has the strength to put the pills in her mouth or to pull the trigger on a gun or whatever she chooses to do. So that by doing that, by having to do it early at point A instead of over at point C, she has lost this amount of potential life. And so her right to that potential life is what the court said decriminalized somebody being able to aid her in dying. Okay, so it's, they did not give a right to assisted suicide or a right to euthanasia. That's all over the media that we now have this right to have this. What they did was they decriminalized someone helping. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's, it's what you would call a negative right. So you have the right not to be prosecuted if you help, but it's not a positive right where you have to provide this. Okay, so that, it, it's a little technical, but it's, it's a very important difference. Essentially, if, if the government had decided, or if each province had decided, well, yes, it's, it's legal, fine, it's going to be legal, but we're not paying for it under MS, uh, well, we call it MSP in, in British Columbia. We're not paying it for, under, is it, what is it, OHIP? Is that what you call it? We're not going to pay for it under OHIP, just like we don't pay for facelifts and a bunch of other things. And if, if you want to have this, if it's such a big deal for you, then it's not illegal for somebody to do it. Make a private clinic and, and, and do that. But... You know, that's not what the government did. So, but that is, it, it's important to realize that the Supreme Court didn't say, okay, Canada, you have to provide this now. It just said it's no longer part of the criminal code. All right? Okay. So they gave Parliament a year to attempt the legislation, which is about 14 weeks from now. So there have, and nothing is out there. There's a very good panel with Dr. Harvey Chachinoff, who's at the head of it right now. I was just part of a, a physician group that made a presentation to them in Vancouver on, uh, on Monday. Uh, and I hope they were appointed by the Harper government. And I do hope that um, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau will listen to whatever recommendations they come up with because they're being very thoughtful. Um, and I have heard some rumblings that the, the new government is hoping to ask the Supreme Court for an extension, and I hope that they do that too. And I hope that the court does, um, does pay attention and give us some time to think about this. Now, Quebec is just totally on their own about this. And what they did in Quebec was that they redefined and I, I'm going to use the word killing. Uh, I know that some people think that that is a bit pejorative, but I find it, I'm not trying to be pejorative, I'm just trying to be accurate. Uh, so taking someone's life just takes a long time to say. So they've redefined killing as part of health care. So in the past, anything that had to do with assisted suicide or euthanasia was federal because it was part of the criminal code. So what Quebec did was they said, Ah, health care is provincial. So what we're going to do is we're going to redefine this as part of health care. And never once did they use assisted suicide, never once did they use euthanasia. They called it medical aid in dying. Well, Dr. Balfour Mount, who was my mentor and teacher, said, 
that's what I've, he's the head of, Pal the, the founder of palliative care in Canada. He says, that's what I've been doing for the last 40 years is medical aid in dying and I've never killed a single person. So that, it, it was part of that obfuscation of the language that made our group choose to talk about physician hasten death. So in Quebec, they have this whole thing set up and their law is not an assisted suicide law. It's only euthanasia. And at the time they passed the law, they said people would be able to opt out and hospices would not be included and now the government is being kind of bullying people about having to participate. <clears throat> so what euthanasia and ass assisted suicide are not. So it's not withholding or withdrawing medical treatment uh, that is useless, futile, burdensome, extraordinary, or something that the person doesn't want. You already have the, had the right for years in Canada to turn down any treatment that you did not want to have, no matter how life-saving it was. Okay, a competent person did. Jehovah's Witnesses don't have to take blood products. If, any, if you just said, I never want to be intubated ever in my life, you don't have to have that. No matter how life-saving it might be, even if you have a bad allergic reaction, those things, those things are there. It also is not the proper use of large doses of pain-killing drugs to, with the intent to relieve suffering. In fact, all the scientific studies show that if we use enough pain medication to get the pain under control, people live longer. <laughs> it's a big myth that we kill people with opiates. In fact, any place where euthanasia is, is done with medications, they don't use opiate medications. They use barbiturates and a whole bunch of other things to kill people. They do not use opiate medications because it isn't efficient. <laughs> There's a big window of safety, especially in end of life things, between relieving suffering and, the, and causing the person's death. So it's not that. And we also have a procedure that called palliative sedation, which is part of the continuum of palliative care. If someone has just terrible symptoms that we can't get under control any other way, then we can, uh, we can do what we call proportionate palliative sedation. So we can get the person sleeping, there's a bunch of different medications that we use, and if, if it's right near the very end of life, then we just allow the person to sleep until the disease process takes its course and the person dies. But if it's not right at the very end, often we'll just give them a chance to rest. So I don't know whether any of you women who have ever been in labor remember what that was like, but I'd have paid a lot of money for about a five minute nap in the middle of my 26 hour labor. I mean, you could have really gotten some good change out of me for that. And, and that's kind of what this idea is, to give people just a rest so that they can, they can do that. And there's, it's really interesting, there's a, a new medication, and I, the, the trade name is Presidex. The, the other name for it is so long that and I always mispronounce it, I'm just gonna give you the trade name. And it's used in uh, post-op and some other, other places, Randy probably knows the name of it, but uh, it's, it's, what it does, it allows sedation where the person is still rousable. So you can sedate the person and they can wake up and interact with family members, eat, drink, and then go back to sleep. And we have a series of cases that we've used it for in British Columbia and it has been astonishingly fantastic. So we're, it's, it's quite expensive, so that'll have to, but that always is the case with medications when they first come out. So there are some things on the horizon that you don't have to necessarily end up with the person being dead in order to relieve symptoms. And, uh, and then we've, we've talked about all these other terms that are euphemisms that have been created. So the other thing is that the Supreme Court of Canada didn't say, they, they were a little bit cagey in their, in their uh, decision that they put out. There were a whole lot of different interveners in this case that said, please put in something about conscience protection so that people who have conscientious objection to this, whether on religious grounds, whether on medical grounds, on clinical judgment, any of those things, uh, just on their own moral grounds with no religion behind it, can, don't have to participate. So 
<clears throat> Instead of doing that, what the court said was there's nothing in this ruling that would compel physicians to participate. And they, but they left it to the regulating bodies, the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and, and all the other ones across the country to balance, as they called it, the rights of patients and physicians in terms of access and providing these things. So this has not been encouraging to those of us who do have conscientious objections to this because uh, here in Ontario, the, the College of Physicians and Surgeons here has, has been very clear that anything that is legal, uh, the physicians are expected to make a formal referral for. And not only that, if it's an emergency, they're expected possibly to have to even perform. So if, if you're a person who would like to have a doctor who doesn't want to do these things, then you need to make your voice known to your government and to the College of Physicians and Surgeons that you feel that your right to have a doctor who practices in that way is being trampled on because this, it may drive people out of medicine who, who believe this way if they're told they have to participate in things that they find morally objectionable. <clears throat> so what they try to tell us though is that referral is not, you're not being complicit if you just refer. Well, it's kind of interesting because either you can self-refer to something and then you don't need to bother with those of us who don't want to refer, or if you have to have a referral, then you're part of the process. So you can't have it both ways. You either are or you aren't. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that we as Canadians understand this because we don't refer for capital punishment. If a prisoner is in our prison system and is going to be extradited to Texas, for example, on a capital crime, and we have to have from the government of Texas guarantee that that person will not face the death penalty before we extradite because we understand that we would be complicit. And the doctor would be is a lot closer than we would be as a government in terms of that, uh, in terms of that scenario. We also rejected capital punishment in Canada because there might be one wrongful death. That was what we said. And yet, the people that would go to that wrongful death have been through this very long court process. And I think there, there would have been wrongful deaths. We've seen people who have been exonerated 20 and 30 years later. I'm not disputing that. But I can tell you as a physician who's, who's been in practice for a long time, Medical decisions don't get that sober thought like that. They're often made in a, in a busy intensive care unit or in the midst of a family in crisis. So what are we saying if we're, if we're willing with the justice system to say, no, we don't even want one wrongful death, but we're not, gonna, we're not going to uh, give that same consideration within the medical system. And Justice Lynn Smith, who was the, the original judge that heard the, the case in British Columbia, she admitted that there would be some collateral damage. And she said, but it's just like any other medical procedure, is what she said. So that we don't stop people from having hip replacements because some people are going to die having a hip replacement. So if we want people to be able to have this, well, too bad. That's going to happen. And the other thing that she did, she did within her her judgment is she saw no material difference between actual killing and allowing to die. So this is a huge change in Canadian health law. So that if you were allowing, just not giving any further treatment, allowing the patient to die of the underlying disease, she saw no difference between that and giving an injection to end the patient's life. I think that's a big thing. Um, and then she looked at the other jurisdictions where she admitted there were problems and she just said, Canada can do better without any evidence that we necessarily can. So the other thing about it is uh, that I didn't really understand before this decision is that when the Supreme Court hears a case, they do not look at how the original trial judge came up with his or her opinion. They accept everything from that trial judge as being true. 
and as being correct because it's considered very bad taste and very bad form to go back and look at the same things. The only things they're allowed to look at or that they choose to look at, or what happened between, for example, June 2012, when the decision came down in British Columbia, until uh, October of 2014, when the decision was heard at the Supreme Court. That's all they look at, the stuff that came afterward. No new evidence is allowed to be introduced, and however the trial judge interpreted the evidence is, is how the Supreme Court uh, interprets it as well. And this is interesting because the, Supreme, the, the judge's evidence, Justice Lynn Smith in British Columbia, she had some very interesting ways of looking at the witnesses. One of the witnesses was Dr. Herbert Hendon, and he is a full professor of psychiatry at a university in New York City. He's been the head of an international, he's a, a psychiatrist, he's the head of an international suicide prevention organization, and she labeled him as a biased witness. Margaret Batten is a woman who is a PhD and uh, in, I think in philosophy she did a lot of work about John Donne. She's been a strong proponent of dying with dignity per se in the US uh, and, and assisted suicide and she's done some soft uh, sociological research about it. The judge labeled her a primary researcher and Herbert Hendon a biased witness. And that's the kind of evidence that the Supreme Court looked at when they made their decision. Uh, and they used her analysis. Now, the Irish High Court looked at the same evidence that Justice Lynn Smith did and came to the complete opposite decision, that it was, it was dangerous. So this is a big change in Canadian law. Uh, this is the first time that in our history, well, all, all lives are not protected, and that we're saying that some lives are not worth living, and we're going to help you die. Now, where is it already legal? This, I kept having to change this slide because it keeps spreading. So, it's, it's been available in Oregon for, since the late 1990s. Uh, 2008, it came in in Washington State, Vermont a couple years ago. California just passed it, it's not in law there yet, uh, and they did a really backdoor thing. They voted it down with the main assembly and then brought it in through a new committee uh, attached to a budget bill and passed it. Uh, <clears throat> and euthanasia is in the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Colombia. Switzerland has had an assisted death for a long time, but it's kind of an odd thing where it's not actually doctors who are involved with it. So it's it's its own little it's its own little thing. And I told you about Quebec, and there's hearings about this in over half the states in the U.S. now. After um, after the situation with Brittany Maynard, many of you have probably heard of her, the young woman who was uh, 29 years old and took her own life just about this time last year. And the, the folks who used to be called uh, the Hemlock Society and then changed their names to Death with Dignity and now call themselves Compassion and Choices because they did some focus groups that found out that anything that had to do with death didn't sell very well. Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. That's exactly what they did. So now they call themselves Compassion and Choices. And before before she died, they had professionals come in and make videos of her and do all of these kinds of things. So uh, with that at their back, they have pushed into the, uh, the <clears throat> into the legislatures all over the U.S. There's massive media attention. And when you get a young woman like Brittany Maynard who moves from California, excuse me just a minute, have some little water here. She moves from California to Oregon so she can kill herself when she wants to. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. So I actually call it the don't ask so you don't have to tell the way the media is working on this. I, <clears throat> I wrote to, there's a program on the CBC called the 180 where they're supposed to talk about both sides of issues. So they talked about this issue at one point and I wrote them a four page letter and I said I don't want any of this on your website, I'm sick of being yelled at, but just so you know, all this was wrong. <laughs> and they wrote me back and they said, we'll give you three minutes to talk about this on the radio. Well, when the average sound bite is seven seconds, three minutes is a long time. So I said, I'll take it. And one of the points I wanted to make was what was going on in countries where it was already legal. And they said, oh no, you can't talk about that. We only want to hear about the Canadian context. 
And I said, the Canadian context, this was two years ago, it's not legal here. And they said, well, too bad, you know, We'd, we want to hear about it. And I said, well, I'm not going to do it then. And they said, well, you go ahead and do it. But we reserve the right to edit for length. Yeah, well, guess what part got cut out? <clears throat> anyway, uh, I said to them, this is poor journalism. If this were a nuclear power plant, or an oil pipeline, you would be everywhere in the world where those things are and you would be finding out how the people are experiencing those things there and you would be coming back with the statistics. This is, this is just poor journalism. So this is just what we're going to talk about. Um, two important themes. Stuff that I skip by here, just, you know, it's just kind of to give the outline when you get the slides. So my friend Tom Koch is, um, he's the ethicist for the Down Syndrome Society. He's not a religious person uh, and has really done some good thinking about this. He, I give you his website at the end in my, uh, with my, uh, my, in my credits there. And one of the things he says is we need to reclaim the language because things of the terms have been hijacked. And they say, oh, it's about end of life decision making when it's not about that, it's about deciding to end life. And he said at least the Dutch people are honest when they call it termination. <clears throat> And I, I really like this little thing he said. It's not about autonomy or independence against medical paternalism. You can choose to re refuse care or commit suicide. It's about the desire of some for us to accept their judgment that life is not worth living, embrace and facilitate their deaths through medical in interventions supported by the approved by the state and supported by it. So it's, it's, a, it's different than just saying, oh, you can have what you want. It's we now, it's, it's being asked for us to make this happen, to use our tax dollars, to use our, um, to use our personnel, to use our, uh, our legal system to do that. It's about affirmation, not just acceptance. And... Um, Disability rights activists, this is another thing Tom said, equating the need for help with indignity assumes only the purely independent are worthy of continuance. And if you think about that in terms of people living with disabilities, uh, and it's not whose life is this, but what life will we support as a people and what deaths will we encourage through our programs. So that's what we're really thinking about. Um, Dr. John Wyatt is a neonatologist in Britain and he spoke at a, a major conference a couple summers ago and he said, what the compassion of these practices is really saying, I care so much about you that I'm willing to kill you or to provide the means for you to kill yourself. And if I say, if I say that slightly differently, I care so much about you, I am willing to cause your death or to provide the means for you to cause your own death. People on the other side are they fully agree with that. That's what they think. Okay, this is a big slide, but uh, his Bill Peace is a really interesting activist, and he, I have a black lab, and he has a black lab. He's a really interesting guy. But he, he, was, he, he writes a, a blog called The Bad Cripple, which gives you a little something about his, uh, his sense of humor. And he was involved in Massachusetts where this uh, a, a, a plebiscite was defeated a couple years ago, and he was talking about, they weren't talking about the larger cultural issues. People wore these buttons that said, my life, my choice, my death. And he said, this is just wrong. You know, nobody dies in a vacuum. And, um, and this is true. Look at all the limits we have on our autonomy. <laughs> we have speed limits. You know, some, some of us could drive faster and still be safe. Some of us could, could um, probably, some could drink and, and drive at a, a higher level. But we have limits because of our concern for our community. We quarantine people with Ebola. We quarantine people with this really terrible form of tuberculosis. We don't even let you use pesticides on your, your own property. If you have an old oil tank in Vancouver, you have to dig it out of your backyard because it might harm your neighbors. You know, what is this? In Vancouver, we have a bylaw that says you are not allowed to smoke outdoors on a public beach. Outside. Now, I'm telling you, the toxic effects of people being, being given the, the encouragement to hasten their deaths are way more important than any secondhand smoke you're going to get outdoors on a public beach. And yet, we all, oh, we don't want to encroach on anybody's autonomy. Think about it. Um, 
what kind of world do we want to leave for our grandchildren? I have one coming. Oh, I'm so excited. My first grandchild is on the way for February. So I'm going to skip this part by Margaret Somerville. She's wonderful, but um, I'm just going to pass that. So this idea about public safety, too. All right, so we don't, the, the longest time that this has been legal any place is about 20 years, except for the Swiss experiment. And that is a very short time when you consider 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years of Hippocratic medicine. We can't know all the outcomes. Okay, so who can tell me why starlings were introduced in Central Park? Who knows this? Yes. Yes. Some bright light thought that Central Park in New York City should have one of every bird that was mentioned in Shakespeare. Now, 20 years after that was done, it probably, they probably didn't think anything of it. But we all think about it now, you know. And another one is, they, they, someone decided that it would be a good idea to bring mongooses, and I actually looked it up, that is the plural, mongooses to Hawaii to kill the rats. Well, nobody actually bothered to think about the biology of it because the mongooses hunt in the daytime and the rats are out at night. So they brought them, and guess what the mongooses eat? They eat birds' eggs. They eat little birds. So all the tropical birds are having trouble in Hawaii, except on the island of Kauai, where the mongooses did not get introduced because the urban legend, at least, has it that when the person was picking up the cage to put them on the dock, one of them bit him, and he threw the whole thing in the water. So they have, they have better birds on Kauai. So whether or not that's true or not, there's, there are big signs. Every golf course you know, has a sign up that says, you know, if you see a mongoose, call us, and they trap them because they want to keep Kauai mongoose free. But everybody thought these were a great idea. And I don't know whether you remember a couple years ago, somebody put a whole lot of iron filings, just iron, elemental iron, in the ocean to try to cause an algae bloom to feed the fish. And the environmentalists went ballistic about this. Oh, you don't know what the effect of that's going to be. Why are we not going ballistic over this in terms of, of what the effect is going to be on our, our, our social environment? Okay. This is a big slide, but all it's really, the main thing I want you to see is that 74% of people who uh, are palliative care physicians think that this should not be part of palliative care, and the majority of us oppose both things. 73% of us oppose euthanasia, 69% oppose assisted suicide. So the people who actually deal with folks at the end of life understand the dangers, and we think this is a bad idea. Uh, Someone said, would you still build the bridge if 75% of the, of the engineers thought it was a bad idea? Also, the parliamentary committee uh, that was reported out in 2011 showed that only 30% of Canadians, and that was the high, it's 16 to 30%, have access to proper palliative care. So are we going to something so radical as ending people's lives when 70% of our population doesn't have access to proper end-of-life care? One of the other things that I would say is that I, I began palliative care in the early days of palliative care and in Canada, and I saw patients who suffered because they refused to see me because they thought I was Dr. Death. They thought I was like Dr. Jack Kevorkian. And they suffered in pain, and their family suffered in loneliness because they wouldn't, they were too afraid to take the resources that I had to offer them. And other physicians were, ref were afraid to refer their patients to us because of the, we, they were afraid that we would hasten their deaths. Even though the international definition from the World Health Organization of, of uh, for a physician hasten, uh, of, uh, excuse me, of palliative care is that we don't hasten or prolong dying. We just, it's, it's neutral. So I think there could be um, way more patients in pain, definitely an erosion of trust. Patients uh, trust us now to, if they're feeling really down, say, oh, I just wish I could die. And they know we're not going to do it because we're not allowed to do it. So to have to hold that inside and not to be able to tell people how horrible you're feeling, to me, there's way more people that are going to be like that than the few people that they tell us who are really going to have these enduring requests that want to do this. 
Also, p patients feeling like they need to justify continuing to live, concerns over being a burden. We see subtle pressures right now in finances and less than optimal conditions in nursing homes and care facilities. Scarce resources for health care budgets. Um, this is something that I spoke in the Netherlands a couple summers ago. And a Dutch medical student who was my sort of techie helper, she heard the talk twice, poor thing, but she, she wrote me this email afterward and she said, I study in Belgium and I had a lot of classes about euthanasia in the past year. My professors were very proud of the new euthanasia laws and have worked hard to make that possible. They were talking a lot about how good it was that they could now help people to die a more humane death and not leave them suffering. And the message they had for those who did not want to participate was basically that they were inhumane to allow so much suffering, not colleague friendly because you let them do the dirty jobs. Do you notice that? Suddenly it's now a dirty job, right? Okay, and um, while being there for the patient throughout his or her life, you just leave them in their pain of death. Now this is what our medical students are up against. So there's nothing in there about helping them and coming alongside them and doing all that stuff in the middle. It's either leaving them in the pain of death or killing them. I mean, those are the only two options. There's nothing in the middle, which is full of things that we can do. And then she said, you probably won't be surprised to hear that the other medical students in my group thought it was okay to give euthanasia to someone who was only 70 and thought his life was not of much use. So basically depressed without further illness. The Dutch Medical Society, which originally said, oh, this is only for the very end of life and it's really terminal cases and, you know, who wouldn't do that last resort, now say that people over 70 who are tired of life or who have a lot of little things should have access and there should be mobile units that will come to your home to do that for you. So the other thing is, they talk about Oregon and they say, well, there's no reported abuses going on in Oregon. Well. That's partly because there's no reporting in Oregon. They don't report it at all. The, there, there's there's non-compliance isn't monitored. The, the Oregon Public Health Department said that we cannot detect or collect data on issues of non-compliance with any accuracy. There's no investigation of abuse. All they said right there, no authority to investigate individual death with dignity cases. Uh, and th in, in fact, the only standard the doctor has to come up to on the death with dignity stuff is good faith. If you botch the whole thing, if you give the wrong medications, none of that. You only have to be, have meant well. You actually are at greater risk if you treat a patient than if you cause the patient's death because you can be sued for malpractice if you do it wrong when you're treating, but you can't if you're doing this. Uh, the other thing is that you have to lie on the death certificate. And it has nothing to do with the insurance. That's part of the law. You can't discriminate with the insurance. But Brittany Maynard's death certificate says she died of her brain tumor. And the whole world knows that she took an overdose. So, that, and you have, so you have, the doctor has, is required by law to write the underlying disease on the death certificate. And even if the, the, there were no symptoms at the time. The underlying data are destroyed annually. In BC, we have to keep our records for 16 or 17 years after the patient reaches the age of majority. They get rid of the underlying data in one year. And there's no requirement for any psychological assessment. So Margaret Dorr is an elder law specialist in, in Washington state. And here's some things about Washington's law is just a carbon copy of Oregon's law. An heir who will benefit from the patient's death can help the patient sign up. Once the le this is true. Once the lethal dose is issued by the pharmacy, there's no oversight. So uh, you you can bring it home that you just want to have that little thing there. You're talking about it's your 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 lovely uh, grandson is taking care of you, and you see something about the tsunami that just happened. You say, oh, I think I'll send some money to that, and he says, you're not sending my inheritance. <laughs> Gives you the, even if he smothers you and dumps the dugs down the toilet, who's going to know? You have basically said, you know, if I die suddenly, don't ask any questions because there's no oversight to it. And once the drug leaves the pharmacy, they don't recall it if you die of something else. So there's a lethal dose that's just out there floating around. And self-administer actually can legally mean somebody putting it in your feeding tube or putting it in your mouth for you. So the, if, if that looks like good safeguards to you, because everybody says, oh, it's working great in Washington and Oregon. They have great safeguards. That's what the safeguards are. So 
these folks are great. The, the, I'm going to whip through this. Disability rights activists, let's just say they're very upset about this. There's a few who say we, we want to have this if we want it, but the vast majority see the writing on the wall that, that if, you're t if, you, if you say suicide prevention for people who are non-disabled and, and suicide or euthanasia for people who either have a disability or who are um, recently disabled by illness, Okay, because the reason that people ask for it is not because of terrible pain, it's because of disabilities, as you will see. So, Marilyn Golden has a great article. I've given you a link to it. She said, pain isn't the reason, it's the indignity. And she says, have we gotten to the point that we will abet suicides because people need help using the toilet? Uh, the reasons that people ask for it, about 90% loss of autonomy, 87.4% the loss of ability to engage in activities that make life enjoyable, loss of dignity, 83%. You know, things like that. That's what it is. It's about control. It's not about symptoms. 45% um, in 2007, the things were going up about being a burden to their families. Uh, and sh one of the, th the points that disability rights activists make is that it, if you've got the choice between living without proper support and death, that's not really a choice. It's a false autonomy. Diane Coleman, I know her. She's the head of a not dead yet group in the U.S. They took their name from Monty Python. And um, she has people come up to her in public and say, I'd rather be dead than be like you. And she's in a wheelchair. She says she finds it extremely offensive. She's a lawyer that people would say that they'd rather die than live a life like mine simply because I leak, as she puts it. Uh, this is my friend Amy Hasbrook. She's the head of uh, the Not Dead Yet in Canada. And she wrote a really interesting little article about what about my right to cry for help? If nine out of ten suicide attempts are a cry for help, what about all those other nine? Why are you so sure you want me to be successful the first time? Because I have a disability. And so she, she's got a visual impairment. So she had her sister-in-law draw this little cartoon. And it's got a building and the steps go up and it says suicide prevention program. And then there's a wheelchair ramp up the side and it says assisted suicide over that. So uh, Carol Gill is a disability rights activist uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I've had some correspondence with her. She's really interesting. She uh, has, is a polio survivor and uses a ventilator some of the time. And she's got really interesting, these two articles are really interesting. But one of the questions she asks in them is, why is it that the media are all over people like Brittany Maynard, a disabled person who wants to die? But nobody touches it when a disabled person wants to have a clean place to live and wants to have a job. You know, where are they then when they want to live? It's just when you want to die. What does that tell us about how our society sees people who are living with disabilities? Um, I don't know, Atul Gawande has, he writes for the New York Times, he's a physician in New York, I think. He wrote a book called Being Mortal, and he actually comes down in this book to thinking that maybe he could support assisted suicide where he would write the prescription. So I, I just give you that, but it's interesting what the, the things that he's concerned about. Even a person who thinks that it might not always be bad, he said, we damage entire societies if we let providing this capability divert us from improving the lives of the ill. Assisted living is far harder than assisted death, but its possibilities are far greater as well. And then he said, I fear what happens when we expand the terrain of medical practice to include actively assisting people with speeding their death. I am less worried about abuse of these powers than I am about dependence on them. That is a very interesting thing. And we, we, this came down to us, there was a, uh, one of my colleagues was in a meeting in Halifax with the, uh, uh, and someone asked this, this Dutch physician how he would treat someone who had a malignant bowel obstruction, what he would do in that case. And the, the Dutch physician said, and we do this all the time, we take care of people with malignant bowel obstructions, we make it better if we can, and we deal with the symptoms if we can't. He said, I, I don't really know. I usually just deal with that with euthanasia. So that's exactly what Dr. Gawande is talking about, is not having that, that curiosity and that creativity to really care for people. I'm going to skip past my friend Ross Harding. You can get that. See, you can get these if you send me an email. I'll give you all this stuff. 
There's problems where it's already legal. I think I've shown you that. There's a great article out of uh, Oregon. Uh, Dr. Ganzini's stuff shows that uh, this, they did a really good study, showed that 20% of the people were depressed, and yet they're not doing the screening on these folks, and depression is treatable. Dr. Chachanoff's study showed that 59% of the patients who had a, had a request for assisted, uh, for a hastened death had depressive symptoms, and only 8% of the patients without that request had depressive symptoms, and yet they're not doing that kind of screening. The idea is fierce independence. That's what these folks want. If they can't get death, they'll somehow, then they're going to get themselves dead before, so that it's kind of getting back at death. Um, it's really interesting. 105 people died in 2014 from Oregon, and only three of them had a psychological assessment. In the last five years, only 2% being referred for psychological evaluations, despite those statistics. Also, I think this is one of the things that is really concerning uh, from a public safety standpoint. There was a study published in our own Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2010 that, sh that they, they sent the survey, a confidential survey, out to um, the doctors who had reported that they had hastened the death of their patients, okay? So these were the doctors that actually filled out the paperwork, the conscientious ones. About half of them do that. Half of the other ones, they just do the, the euthanasia and don't fill it out. And of those conscientious ones, they found that 32%, or one in three of those patients, had not given explicit consent. Now, they didn't call that killing. I'm not making this up. They called it LAWER, life-ending act without explicit request. Okay, so they found that was really interesting that the people who had the law were tended to be people who were older, had non-cancer diagnoses, and were not as competent. So they had dementia, they had heart disease, they had other things. And the doctor just decided that the person was going to be better off dead. And the most chilling part of this to me was in 8.9% of the time, the reason the doctor gave for not asking the patient's permission was that it would be too stressful for the patient. So it was less stressful just to kill you than it is to ask you if you want to die. Now, my own father died about a year and a half of Alzheimer's in his, his 90s, and I understand what they were saying. It would have been very stressful to ask him, Dad, do you think you've had enough now? And he would have been really confused. But that still doesn't give you the right to decide for another person. People are often saying, oh, we treat our dogs better than we treat people. Well, you know what? The dog doesn't get to decide. Somebody else decides that the dog's life is not worth living anymore. So before you say that, think about it. Uh, and then people on the other side of this decided, oh, well, we better look at these cases. So they went back and they looked at the cases and they saw that, well, these weren't all really euthanasia cases. Sometimes they were sedation. Sometimes it was proper pain medicine. But I don't care what it really was. The doctor thought every time that they'd hasten this patient's death. If I give you a little tube of medicine and I say, go inject that dog over there and kill the dog, and you do it, whether it was just water or not, doesn't really matter to me. You, had, you, you, you would have done it. <laughs> so it doesn't really comfort me that it was, they didn't really kill them. Um, okay. There was a brand new study out. This is one of the most important slides for tonight, and I'm sorry it's all numbers. Uh, but it's, it's important. A brand new study this year, and what they found was that in Belgium, 4.6% of all deaths were euthanasia deaths, and 1.7% of all deaths were euthanasia deaths without explicit consent. So I thought, hmm, that doesn't sound like a lot, but I wonder what that would translate into if I looked up Statistics Canada. So. I, w I got, went to the 2014 Stats Canada stuff, and I guess it's deaths from 2011 or something, but it's, it's close. So 4.6% of that would be 11,000 deaths. That's about 30 deaths a day, all right? And it would be tied with the fourth leading cause of death in Canada. That's tied with lung disease, all people who died of lung disease. Only cancer, heart disease, and stroke were higher causes of death. And that 1.7%, that would be between the 8th lead, eighth and ninth leading cause of death in Canada, 11 per day. So you've got more than 40 a day 
with euthanasia, which is what's coming in in Quebec and what our Supreme Court has landed us with. And what the, the media say is, oh, well, there's not that much going on. Look at Washington and Oregon. It's only 0.2%. That would be less than 500 people a year here in Canada. But we are looking at more than 15, 15 16,000, not 500 a year. And if we think that our people are going to be any different than the people in Belgium, I think we're kidding ourselves. People are going to go for this. Um, and only about a half the deaths are reported. Uh, this just is a slide to show that one of, the, one of the guys who was an author of the law in Belgium says there are problems with the Belgian euthanasia law. We have him on tape saying that. But everybody here in the media says, oh, there's no trouble in Belgium. So... Yep, nurses are doing it too. Yep. So who will be allowed to do it? Suppose, well, nurses aren't allowed to do it in, in Belgium either, but nobody's ever been prosecuted. They are. We've got studies where they admit that they're doing it. So, uh, and then it's, it's it, it, they talk about slippery slope. There's no such thing as a slippery slope. Stop being a fear monger. Well, since 2005, they've had a thing in the Netherlands called the Groningen Protocol which allows for the euthanasia of newborns. And they have adopted this in, the, in uh, Belgium as well. Uh, and th about 9% uh, of cases in Belgium and 7% of cases in the Netherlands of deaths of children under one year of age are euthanasia deaths. And it was brought in mostly for kids with spina bifida who can actually live quite wonderful, productive lives. And in Belgium, one of the things that's interesting they don't, they, they don't even talk to the parents one in five times. They just, the doctors make the decision. So one out of every five of those children that's killed is killed without ever asking if the family wants to bring this child home and love this child. Uh, minors can request this in, uh, uh, I got this right off the Dutch web, government website. You can request through the age of 12, uh, 13 and 14, uh, you, year olds, um, 15 year olds have to have um, consent of the parents up to the 16. 16 and 17 year olds don't need to have your parents consent, but you need to have, uh, you need to tell them. And when you're 18 and older, you don't even have to let your parents know. Now, we already know that your frontal lobe, which is the place that tells you how what you're doing today is going to affect you in the future, isn't fully developed till you're about 25. Car rental companies have figured this out years ago, and they won't rent to you till then. But you can make a decision whether your life is worth living or not at that point. In fact, they, they, approved, the, they approved the euthanasia of a 24-year-old woman who was physically completely healthy. She, has just, uh, in, she just said, life isn't for me. And she's never felt that way through her life. And they approved her euthanasia. I'm not sure whether it's been carried through. There's other examples of all the stuff that's happened. I, I won't even tell you all these things, but... Um, an elder, healthy elderly couple, their, do, their son shopped around and found somebody who would do it and he said it was the best solution. If one of them should die, the one who would remain would be so sad and totally dependent on us. I mean, what is, what is this? That's the thing that Dr. Gawande was saying about not, not abuse, but become dependent upon this to solve, solve problems. And if you don't believe me about the deaf twins going blind, choosing to be euthanized, that's the, the thing there because people didn't think. So just all the things that, who does, yeah, if you, this one is, if you have a serious uh, or incurable condition, are you without dignity unless you commit suicide or are killed by a doctor? That's a question. Just some other things about expansion. Uh, that's a little thing I wrote about um, how suicide contagion in Oregon used to have a lower suicide rate. Now it's 35% above the national average uh, because suicide is seen as a way of, of solving problems. Uh, Dr. Donald Lowe, many of you probably saw his impassioned plea. Uh, he died at home in his wife's arms in no pain, and yet somehow he was considered to have not a dignified death. Now, I would be so lucky to, to die like that in my loved one's arms at home. And I was, qu I was in, quoted in an article that his wife was quoted in, and um, she said, well, why should I have to spend the last two weeks of my life, because he was sedated, why should I have to spend the last two weeks of my life with a corpse? That's what she said. 
Jeanette Hall, doctors can be wrong, Jeanette Hall's still alive, she was diagnosed in 2000, <laughs> she's still alive and her doctor kind of talked, talked to her for a while until she decided to try some treatment and she ended up uh, taking it and she's, she carries a little sign around, glad to be alive. I'm just going to skip Dr. Mount. Uh, discrepancies that we already have, we've talked about this. You go into a, a pediatric hospital and it's beautifully painted, there's colorful things on the walls, stuff is set out there, the right size for the children. You go into the geriatric wards, they're always in the worst part of the hospital. The paint sucks the light out of the room, the color of the paint does. Many nursing homes, I go in there to take care of patients and they smell like urine. They're, they're no less dependent than the babies are. Why does it smell like urine there and it doesn't smell like urine on the, on the pediatric floor? You know, we are crazy about how we're doing this. People have said to me, don't be so sure you're opposed to euthanasia until you've seen a nursing home. You might want it someday. To me, that says something terrible about us as a culture. And what this, I, I love dogs and I read this guy, his, funnily, his name is Katz and he writes, uh, writes about dogs. He even wrote a book called Cats on Dogs. But this book about the new work of dogs, he, he talks about things that dogs do in their life. And he, he followed around this, these rescue people and he talked about what they, what they did. And he said all the things that happened. And he said, I'm oh, in awe of their heroic work. I'm also conscious of the fact that there is no equivalent national network for troubled humans. If you type dog rescue into Google, you'll get nearly three quarters of a million hits. If you type people rescue, you get five or six. And you know, listen to the things they say. They say things like, well, he's old and yes, he has behavioral problems, but he's earned his retirement. You know, he, he's, he's earned us taking care of him. Why haven't our elders done the same thing? You know, even when they have behavioral issues. Um, Hippocratic medicine, do no harm, 2400, 2400 years. It's not, it was before Jesus, so it's not Christian. Um, and one of the things Margaret Somerville says it, that I said, you know, it's like, an, it's like an old growth forest that we have protecting life and caring for one another. And she said, yes, we're just as responsible for our metaphysical environment as we are for our physical environment. And what legacy are we leaving for our kids and our grandkids? And Theo Bohr, who's a Dutch ethicist, said, you know, don't go there. He's been very upset. He was on the committee that actually looked at these requests and was in favor of the law in the Netherlands. And he said now he's seen such an uptick in what's going on with, the, with people with, um, uh, with uh, reasons for the numbers because of psychological reasons. And he said, don't let the genie out of the bottle. Um, how do we help? This is a sign at the University of British Columbia that's completely blank except for a little thing that says you are here. So I think there are lots of ways we can help. I'm just going to skip through this. There are ways that we can do dignity conserving care. Uh, we can do meaning-centered therapy. We can, there are developmental stages we can help with in people who are dying. The founder of Modern Palliative Care, Cicely Saunders, said, you matter because you are you, and, and you matter to the very end of your life, and we will do all we can not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. And Balfour Mount, this is just about being fellow travelers, Don Quixote. Uh, this is really interesting about Louisa May Alcott. She was a nurse in the U.S. Civil War and she's got some really interesting things about accompanying patients. So I'll let you write me for the slides and you can read that little vignette. Uh, the other thing, I spoke at a caregiving conference that said 90% of caring is just showing up. So do that. Just show up. And some people are natural carers and some people go and wash the dishes and whatever you can do. Caring means showing up. And you need a little margin in your life. Don't write out to the, all the edges. You need some room so that you can actually care. I'm not going to tell you Teague's story. He's a very interesting little guy. Okay. Some stuff that you can do to help people. Things that people can do from out of town. 
The stinging nettle is an interesting thing. The, the interesting thing about the stinging nettle is that when you grasp it really firmly, you don't get stung. But when you just brush up against it, you get stung. And I think this is a really fitting thing for the difference between being with people who are suffering. If you really get in there and care for them, there's a richness that you get in being able to help another person. Something that's very deeply human that you don't get if you just think, ooh, that person's suffering, I'm just going to brush up against it. And you have a lot of pain from that. Uh, now, this little Christian part, I'm going to whip through this too because I know you've all uh, been listening far too long. Uh, who knows where this comes from? Where it says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. I haven't heard the right number yet. Nope. First Corinthians... 12. Yes, it's the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12. So, but what it does is it introduces 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. And even people who are not Christians really love this passage about what love does. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And I put it to you tonight that the most excellent way is the way of love. And that that's what we're here on this earth to do, is to care for each other. Whether you're religious or not, that's what it's about. It's not about saying, oh, you really want to be autonomous? Okay, let's help you end your life, in my opinion. Um, there's a, I'm going to whip through this too. This is Dr. Sheila Cassidy, who is talking about... Uh, she, she's a hospice director, she was, I'm sure she's retired now, uh, in Britain, and she talked about Mary, the Martha's sister, who took her alabaster jar and poured out the ointment and over Jesus to anoint him for his burial. And she said, when we care extravagantly, that aroma of our caring goes up as a witness in our culture. And that's one of the things I think is, is beautiful. Um, and then from a Christian context, so any of you who are uh, from a different faith-based or no, no faith, then just let this go. But a friend of mine came over after in March last year, and he said, I heard you on the radio. And I said, well, it's pretty hard to avoid me. And he said, oh, I don't really know what to think. And I looked at him. I'd known him for a long time. I said, seriously? I'm usually a little more diplomatic, but he said, I said, do not kill is pretty basic. You know, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And so we talked about it. And do we really trust God and his plan for our lives? Do we really believe that he's in control? Uh, do we really believe that we're not our own? Do we believe that we're created in his image and we're not to deface the image that he's given us? Uh, and there's also no such thing as, the, as a death that affects only the person who died. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that independence is not a Christian virtue. Interdependence is a Christian virtue. And we need to think about that. And I don't even think independence should be a Canadian virtue. I think interdependence should be that as well. <clears throat> So we need creativity and imagination to help us concentrate on care, not killing. Uh, I'm going to give you a real quick rundown on these two necklaces. The, the one that's a coin is the last gift my dad gave me. And what that coin is, it's a little lepta. It's from the time of Jesus. And it's one of those two, the kind of those two little coins that that widow put in the box. And Jesus said, she gave everything she had. And that story really hit me a few years ago that I realized that even when we do something that's really ordinary and nobody else would think cost us anything, that the Lord knows what it costs us. And he sees that. So I have that little necklace to remind me that even the little things that I do, he knows what it costs me. And the other little pearl is a pearl that I bought in Harlem in the Netherlands two summers ago. And I went to visit Corrie Ten Boom's home. And she, uh, if you haven't seen the movie The Hiding Place or read the book, rush out and do it. Uh, her family was a very ordinary Dutch family that hid uh, Jewish people during World War II. And uh, four members of her family paid with their lives to do it. And she went to a prison camp. And uh, while I was at her home, I was really struck by how this ordinary family had provided a hiding place for the vulnerable people in their culture. And that that's what we need to do for people around us, is to provide that same safe haven 
for people around us. So if it's a person, an older person who has no one to speak for them, or someone who is, it has a psychological or a psychiatric illness, those types of things, uh, we, it's our job to provide the safe haven. And I'll just add some thing, other things there. What you can do, being people of hope. Okay, so you can get informed what you're doing tonight, probably more than you wanted to be. Tell your own stories. Um, one of the things I think, too, is think of a few things that are compelling for you. First of all, be kind. Don't assume that everybody who doesn't believe the way you do is, is evil. You know, I, I don't assume that. I think people really have good hearts and they really do care for the most part. But we are kind of like witnesses for the defense. We just need to raise doubts. We don't have to prove the whole thing. We just need to raise doubts. Uh, and then if you've got some kind of a little speech when people say, oh, I'm so glad the Supreme Court did that. If you've got 30 seconds that you can say, well, I'm not so glad. I think it's really a bad decision because, boy, the things that I've seen that have gone on in the Netherlands, that's really scary to me. Or Belgium, that's really scary to me. So learn it. Stay on task. Just learn one thing that'll just poke it in there. Like, or, gosh, it's interesting how we have suicide prevention for people who have, do not have disabilities, but for people who are disabled or newly disabled because of illness, we think suicide or, or euthanasia is a good way out. You know, we have a double standard. Things like that. Um, donating some funds, contacting your government. The Euthanasia Prevention Coalition is always looking for members. They don't have tax exempt status, but if they say they represent a certain number of people, then that's helpful. I'm on the board, full disclosure. Um, other resources here. There's lots of things that are there. There's some uh, good things that are there. There's uh, great resources from the Catholic Church. Uh, as well. This is a particularly good monograph. This was written, it's, it's long, but it's got a really succinct executive summary. It's, it's, it's excellent. He talks about all with care, never kill, how physician-assisted suicide endangers the weak, corrupts medicine, compromises the family, and violates human dignity and equality. And he just goes through all of it. It's all annotated. It has papers. It's, it's just great. So if you, if you just do Ryan T. Anderson Always care, never kill. You'll get it if you Google that. Um, other things from the UK. Uh, and then I want to leave you with the last thing is just with, this is a picture of my sister and me when we're caring for my dad. And my brother did help, but he wasn't there for the picture. <laughs> so, so I don't want to say that he's not involved. But this is, this is what my feeling about this is. I said, in the great sweep of human history, it is not really a circle of caring that we experience. We are carried along in a vast river of caring that flows from generation to generation to generation, buoying us up in the times when we need to be cared for and refreshing us in the seasons when we are the carers. The love we give and receive is both powerful and healing. It's time for our generations to pass along this heritage to the next ones and to protect this river from those who would destroy it or diminish it in any way. And then uh, that's my email address if you want to get in contact with me. So I'm sorry it took so long, uh, but remember my Anne of Green Gables disclaimer. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Margaret. If you had any questions, if you could, I've been not able to secure only one question. Um, if there's any other questions, if you could pass, oh, I see a few, okay. Um, maybe Randy, if you could go down that aisle, if there is any, and. If you have to leave, I'm not gonna be offended if you get up and go, too. And I was passing by in each section, there was a clipboard where you were able, I don't think it's made up to this section yet, if, oh, it's just coming now. If you're wanting to receive the PowerPoint presentation, then I'll make sure that those emails get to Dr. Margaret. Um, have you guys got one question? So, so from a couple of people, this is, I think, uh, coming from some of the physicians in the group too, but what legal rights will there be to intervene in a suicide attempt and, and in terms of the Form 1 that we do when people are suicidal, how is, yeah. how is the future of that going to be? Because currently physicians who, who encounter somebody who is threatening self-harm uh, have a duty to put them under a form and send them to see psychiatry. So right. how do you see that future? 
and so the, the question is how are we going to respond to suicide attempts and people who are suicidal who maybe have are you know not terminally ill or whatever so I, I don't think we have that worked out yet and if you're if you're talking about a place like Washington or Oregon the other thing about Washington and Oregon is they have a requirement for a terminal illness of less than six months left to live so we don't have that uh, with we don't have any guarantee of that and the Supreme Court has made it so open that we don't really know uh, what, what when we're going to be able to intervene so I think it it, it would be hard to say if, if you've had somebody who has had a long-term psychiatric illness who has wanted to attempt suicide and then does. Uh, I, I think we're still, we're in the dark about that. Yeah. There's, a, there's another couple of people that ask a question about, uh, I think something that was on television tonight maybe, so maybe you wouldn't have caught that, but something about right to die movements that are trying to disband the current government panel. Yes. Does that sound familiar? That, that could be happening. Um, <clears throat> the, as I talked to you before, the, the current government panel is, is actually a very a, a reasonable group. Dr. Harvey Chachanoff is one, they were appointed by the Harper government, and Dr. Harvey Chachanoff is chairing it. He is a full professor of psychiatry and is the person who has done the international work. He's gotten all sorts of, of international awards. He's the Order of Canada. He's done the work on dignity conserving care. So he's the chair. Dr. Catherine Frazee is a person living with a disability who's a disability rights activist. She's on it, and a lawyer by the name of uh, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Peltier. And they were appointed by the Harper government. The uh, people who were, are in favor of these practices cried foul because both Dr. Chachanoff and Dr. Frazee, who's not a medical doctor, were witnesses for the government in the Carter case. So, um, the, when the shoe was on the other foot, it pinched a little bit because there is a lawyer here in Canada by the name of Jocelyn Downey who has been behind um, almost all of these pushes. Uh, she's from Dalhousie Law School. She has been behind the uh, Ontario and Saskatchewan uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons trying to uh, limit conscience protection and she's been the per she's been the person who uh, set up the royal Co the royal the royal society report for uh, uh, about euthanasia and assisted suicide and that was uh, she picked the panelist and when we looked at who the panelists were for that we could have written the report before she before it came out and she's also the person who because of this federal panel that was out there she uh, advised the Ontario government to set up another panel which she is serving on uh, and one of the co-chairs of this Ontario panel is Donald Lowe's wife the woman who said that she didn't think she should have had to spend two weeks with a corpse so because uh, and now people think well they, they were really upset about this other panel the other thing that happened was the day after the election Jocelyn Downey was it was announced that Jocelyn Downey had been awarded two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars from the Trudeau Foundation to study end-of-life things so um, you can probably guess where this is coming from in terms of how that she's she's been very vocal about saying that that she'd like to see this panel disbanded but it's been a very thoughtful panel uh, usually when you present to a panel you get 15 minutes maximum we had an hour and 15 minutes with the panel on Monday we, we were able to provide our briefs they asked us questions they were very respectful and I think if if that looks like that's going to happen I think you should call your member of parliament you should say you know please let this panel report whether you pay attention to it or not let it report because they have something important to say so that I'm not surprised if that was on the news tonight that that's happening anything else uh, there's a question here about social workers also a similar to the question of suicidal people if, if people um, our social workers operating in a regime that allows for assisted suicide, how will they deal, deal with the clients who say they're suffering yeah. intolerably? Well, that's the question. How, what do, if, if, if death is the way that we, suffer, that we respond to suffering, where does that stop? 
I mean, we, we all suffer. I mean, life, you have some suffering in your life anyway. So, but what's enough and what, and, and even just um, from, from a palliative care perspective, even people who are at the end of their life, they, they often will have this sense of, oh, I just couldn't go on another day. And then you get their symptoms under control and uh, somebody says a grandchild is on the way. And, oh, I'm so glad you didn't do me in. I'm so glad I'm still here. You know, that kind of thing. One of the, panel, one of the people who was with me on the panel uh, on Monday is a, is a family doctor who specializes in geriatrics and goes to nursing homes. And they had, he talked about two patients that everybody, even the palliative care specialists, thought were right at the end of their life. They sent them to the hospice and they graduated from the hospice. They were there for more than three months. And one of them's been living five years. One of them's been living seven years. They just needed the support. But they would have been easily swayed by something like, like this. Uh, and one of the things that's been in the Quebec law is that everybody has to be offered this as an option. So that to me is just terrible. One of the things that, that we have been saying is that no doctor should ever be the one to bring it up. But that's not what it says in Quebec. So, you know, it's, it's the coercion is, is subtle and not so subtle, you know, when you, when you think about it. Last question, I think, because people are getting very tired. And I will stay here for as long as it takes if you have something you want to talk to me about. I know sometimes people have real hurts in their lives about things that have happened, and I'm, I'm happy to stay and talk about those things if that would be helpful. So, so there's one other question that I want to just I want to just make okay. my own question at the end. But um, could mental illness be classified then as a disability in this context? Yes, it already was. The Supreme Court said that psychological suffering uh, and mental illness uh, those those count. It's not just a physical illness. Here's my feeling on why physicians are a lot pro this. I think it's because of money. Comments. I think that comes down to healthcare dollars and just the idea of how much it's going to cost to provide palliative care, et cetera, for people. Um, I don't think it's all about money. Somebody said, do you trust your government to do the right thing or the cheap thing? And uh, I don't think it's all about money. Uh, but I do think it's, it's interesting. A few years ago, if we would say that, people would say, oh, that makes me a little scared. Now, actually, people who are in a generation below me who, and below that uh, are thinking, you know, if you really want that, why don't you do it? Because I don't want to have to pay for you. I mean, it really is. So using this money argument as something opposed to it we're not using that anymore in euthanasia prevention because people get the idea that they'd like to have the cheap way out, which is part of that whole thing where, like Dr. Gawande said, and he's not a Christian, but where he was saying he's concerned about where, what happens to societies when we do this. And what does this say about us? I, I said in, on the radio on, on the February 6th, I said, we're Canadians. We figured out how to fish in the North Atlantic and farm on the prairies. I mean, we can figure out how to come alongside one another, how to care for one another. If we can pay millions of dollars a year to a person to push a little puck around on the ice, we can find the money to care for people. You know, this is... <laughs> So, you know, that, that, may be, that may be what it is, but we, I, I think we need to make our, our voices clear. Even if you think that you want this at some kind of a level or an option, I think that idea of not having it take away from creativity and, uh, and real effort in caring for people who are not well or who are living with a disability needs to be up there. As, as our number one priority and we need to let the people who are in our governments and in our health authorities know that that's important to us. Okay, well thank you for being such a good audience. I'm sorry it was so long. Well, thank you, Dr. Martin. 
we would like to thank you, Dr. Margaret, for coming and just informing us. It's always nice to hear the facts from a reputable person who's invested in the field and brings us truth. We have a lot to think about. We see that we do have some power in this and that, um, you know, I just pray that peace and love would just fill ourselves as we digest this. And I also just want to say thank you too to uh, Pastor Jason Mills and the Ministry Council for just allowing us to bring Dr. Margaret in and for those who provided financially so that we could bring Margaret here and that we could gather here and, and the staff here that helped to just get the word out to you so that we could become informed. I believe there's power in knowledge and we certainly received our share this evening. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we'll come to, an, to a formal closing but at those who had questions and did not receive the answers that they were looking for you heard Dr. Margaret say that she was willing to hang back and to answer your questions and hear your stories so peace be with you as we leave tonight <laughs>